Okay, this is the news recording. Let's hope this works. Hello and welcome to Australian Breaking News. My name is Robert Llewellyn and I am the founder and one of the hosts of The Fully Charged Show. Now, regular viewers may possibly be able to tell I'm not in my usual studio or indeed what could be classified as warm clothes, mainly because I'm currently sweltering in 33 degree heat and it's very sticky in the wonderful city of Brisbane in Australia. I'm here for two reasons. My Australian wife and I are spending some time with her wonderful family and in particular her mum who turns 93 in a couple of days and I will be attending the Everything Electric Show Australia which takes place on the 9th, 10th and 11th of February at the Olympic Park in Sydney. Like Fully Charged, you'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric Expos around the world. Next up, Australia and London. Remember, energy and transport professionals go free on the first day. Have we mentioned that before on the channel about the show in Sydney? We have. Ooh, okay. In the meantime, there has been a lot of news as we leave 2023 behind and head bravely and with renewed hope and vigour into 2024. Of course, the picture is never all rosy. When is it ever in human life? There's always plenty of negative nonsense that's being spread around. And in this case, it's it spread around like a toxic fungus by the fossil fuel industry. But there are some amazing, amazing bits of news that are leaking out between the torrents of big budget negativity. Here in Australia, sales of electric vehicles rose by 161% in 2023, according to a report in the Sydney Morning Herald. Well-known tree-hugging liberal rag, that is. It's obvious since my last visit how much of that growth in electric vehicles is with brands other than Tesla. Tesla have been here and been very successful for a long time. I'm not denigrating Tesla's mind-boggling success in Australia. There are thousands of Model 3s and Model Ys on the road here. But since I was here last year, I have noticed a really significant increase in the number of other brands of MG, BYD, Kia, Hyundai, all their electric cars, loads of them being driven around. As is so often the case, the charging network, the public charging network in Australia is under a bit of a strain. A lot of new chargers are being installed, but there's still a long, long way to go. This morning, I mean, it's a very, I've got to mention it because it happened. I tried to use a charger in an underground uh, shopping centre car park run by a charging provider in Australia that I've used before. I'm not going to name them. They're very, very good. I've used their chargers a lot. I have an account with them. I have the app. The app is registered with my debit card. But of course, my phone didn't have a signal in the car park because it's underground, so I couldn't use it. I needed an RFID card to go bip, not touch to pay, no other way of getting it. I don't have an RFID card. I don't live in Australia. In a few months, RFID cards are going to be found in the same dusty box as VHS tapes and 8-track cassettes. That sort of frustration is incredibly damaging. But even with that occasional annoyance, things are getting better here. I've used loads of other chargers here without any trouble at all. They all worked. It's just that one. When, it, when you can't use it, thankfully I had loads of rain. Anyway, I was just topping up. Don't want to talk about it anymore. It is interesting to compare the two areas that I live in. Australia is no, uh, without question, behind Europe when it comes to public charging infrastructure. But my goodness, they are catching up fast. The installation of new rapid charges doubled last year, according to a report in the Australian Guardian. The national EV strategy with investments from federal and state governments in Australia plans for a further 1,000 charging locations, not just chargers, locations within the next three years. It also in, in, uh, aims to install chargers every 150 kilometres along the national highway network. And let me just explain for those of you who've never been to Australia, the national highway network is quite long because Australia is quite a big country. So that is a big, big challenge. But as always, there's hiccups along the way, or in this particular case, stink bugs on board. What the, what? That is such a 
This is such a strange story. Now, Australia runs very tight biosecurity, very sensibly, as the Australian continent is effectively isolated from many pests and diseases which afflict the rest of the world. Recently, a cargo ship containing many thousands of new electric cars was ordered to stop off the coast of Brisbane before being turned around and returning to China. The reason? Well, they discovered a load of yellow spotted stink bugs that were hitching a ride with all the electric cars. <laughs> a recent guest on our podcast, Bayad Jafari, chief executive of Australia's Electric Vehicle Council said, deliveries of electric vehicles would have passed over 100,000 vehicles in 2023 if it wasn't for this shit being turned around because of stink bugs. Uh, it's just very funny. I mean, the biosecurity here is impressive. He, it's very sensible, if I may say so. Don't try and smuggle in a banana if you're visiting Australia. You won't get away with it. But that is bad luck because 2023 was a record-breaking year for new car sales across the board in Australia. And yes, electric cars really, really did jump. But let's get real. These EV sales are still dwarfed by comparison uh, to the sale of massive, heavy, inefficient, gas-guzzling, ludicrous SUVs and big, chunky, monkey, butch pickup trucks. Now, I know I've ranted about this before when I'm in Australia, but this fashionable, fashion-based car choice really is a national disease. What will this absurd fashion ever change? Will people go, I don't really need a 2.9 ton pickup. I probably could make do with a little hatchback, an electric one. Yes, a little bit more efficient. Not much hope of that in Australia, but maybe France has the right idea. The French government have recently imposed a penalty tax, the so-called malus écologique, for heavy and polluting combustion vehicles. I don't know why I had to make such a fuss when I was pronouncing that French phrase. Just the malus écologique. It's really hard to say. Malus écologique. This tax was originally imposed uh, back in uh, 2022, but has recently been increased to discourage the purchase and the use of heavy polluting vehicles in France. I mean, it's outrageous. How dare they crush people's basic freedom to drive a three-ton luxury diesel SUV to get a litre of lait et deux croissants pour le petit déjeuner. It's a basic human right to drive one of these massive tanks. But that's being curtailed in La France. So, it's an endless struggle, but things are slowly, I would still argue, changing for the better. And it's always worth remembering that there are multiple advantages that come from electric vehicles. It's not just a mode of transport. That's a very important thing to remember. And there was recently a perfect story to illustrate that, right here in Queensland, literally just down the river and down the, down the coast down there. They had really terrible storms and severe flooding in the state of Queensland over Christmas, before we got here, thankfully, which resulted in widespread power cuts. Now, in the UK, if you're in the dark and there's a power cut, it's just dark and cold in Queensland, it means everything in your fridge and freezer starts to go off, your air conditioning stops working and you start sweltering because, as is the way with weather, after the storm, when they still had power cuts, they had a massive heat wave. Apparently, and there were many examples of this, people were using their electric vehicles, let's be specific, their BYD and Hyundai cars that have come capable of vehicle to load, to send the power from the vehicle into your home, either to run their homes, their air conditioning and freezers, or to run and power their neighbours. And that happened quite a lot. You can also do this with a few other makes of EV, but annoyingly, you can't do this with a Tesla. And there's loads of Teslas here. They just sit still doing nothing in a power cup. Hmm, I wonder if that will ever change. But this one story made the news. This is a report from the Australian Guardian. A woman called Kirsty Holmes used her BYD electric car to power her 11-year-old son's dialysis machine after their power shut off on Christmas Day. Not any old day of the year, Christmas Day. At first, Holmes and her husband used the car to plug in their fridges and those of their neighbours in adjoining units. But when the power didn't come back on quickly, she started to wonder whether the car could handle the life-saving dialysis machine her son needed. We ran it off the car, Holmes said. I'm quoting from the newspaper here, just to make that clear. We ran it off the car, Holmes said. We only needed to use it for the one night. We could have run it for at least four nights, and then we'd have to go and charge the car somewhere. 
I just want to highlight what she said there. She could run this dialysis machine from their car for four nights with no power from anywhere else. I'm just saying that to underline it. Try doing that with your diesel car or your petrol car or your plug-in hybrid. Yes, I know you could get a diesel generator and put it in your backyard, fill it with diesel and go blah, 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 blah. But seriously, don't try arguing that here. Next story. Now, back in Europe, and we're going to be talking about diesel again for the first time since the dawn of the combustion engine. How long ago now? 140 years ago. More people in Europe bought electric cars than diesel cars last year. First time. That's the tipping point in action. We, we, we should only be surprised about the fact that there are people on this planet alive and breathing right now who, in the last 12 months of human history, bought a new, not second-hand, not second, a new diesel vehicle in Europe, where you can't drive the damn things in many city centres already. But so far, everything electric news has been, all the reports I've been talking about, about cars, 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 cars. Is that all you talk about, Llewellyn, you old goat? Ooh. Okay, this next story highlights just how enormous the wider electric ground transport sector has become and the massive global impact it's having. But first, more cars. Uh, this is from a fascinating report from The Conversation, which highlights the myths we all live with when it comes to our cars. In the USA, in the US of A, a staggering 60% of all car trips are under 10 kilometres. For people using old school measurements, that's just over six of your ancient miles in a day. Not 10,000 miles a day, like some weird drivers like to claim in the comments. No, no, no. I drive regularly at least 10,000 miles a day. And if I'd have to stop and recharge, it would take me my lifetime. Yes, whatever, carry on. Roughly, the same statistics apply in Europe and Australia. And it goes without saying that all electric cars, doesn't matter which ones, even the G Wiz can manage a 10 kilometer drive a day for pity's sake. However, this report reveals how the biggest impact on oil consumption isn't as a result of ever increasing electric car use. It's from the 280 million electric scooters and motorbikes that are on the road around the world. 280 million. According to estimates by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the popularity of electric scooters and bikes is already cutting demand for oil by 1 million barrels a day. That's about 1% of the world's total oil demand. That kind of gives you an impression of what our total oil demand is. It's quite a lot. I wonder if the world's oil executives are aware of this. I wonder if they are spending big money spreading negative stories about electric ground transport to try and stem this tide of change. Surely they wouldn't do that. Decent human beings wouldn't lower themselves that much. Surely. That would be a ridiculous thing to claim. And as a result of the research, Bloomberg New Energy Finance have also done some other... I'm going to have to say that again because I got that so wrong. As a result of the research Bloomberg New Energy Finance have done, there's some other very revealing insights. The average petrol car, this is from their research, not me saying it, from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, people who can actually do proper research and mathematics. The average petrol car driving 12,000 miles a year costs around $2,700 when you include fuel, spare parts, and the endless maintenance that uh, combustion cars require. I think that's actually very cheap. I'm impressed. A similar sized electric car, again, including charging and maintenance and spare parts, costs around $720 a year to run. So it's about $2,000 a year cheaper, doesn't matter what the car is, to drive an electric car, which we all knew. And if you didn't know that, I'm telling you now. An electric bike, an electric scooter or electric motorbike doing a 20 kilometer commute five days a week. That will cost about $20 a year. Yes, a year, $20 a year, a year. Just want to underline that, $20 a year. Now, I would argue that there are days when being able to get into a warm, dry car to drive even a short distance is an incredible privilege and a luxury. It's, not going, it's going to be very hard to give up, but I live in a damp, cold country. That said, 
When I was in the car this morning and the temperature outside was 32 degrees centigrade, it was very nice to have air conditioning because <laughs> it was very, very sticky. There are areas of the planet where using bikes and scooters is absolutely the norm and the electrification of these machines means that countless cities' air pollution has reduced, which will save thousands of lives because the toxicity of burning that much fossil fuel in a hot, confined space of a city is disastrous. And that's why they are, these bikes are so popular. And yes, we are often reminded how these fancy pants electric vehicles with their batteries require us to dig up and refine enormous amounts of materials. Yes, yes, we know about that. But no, one thing I've learned over the past decade and a bit is just as you think you have a handle on what we need to produce a battery, the whole thing changes again. A joint venture between VW in Europe and JAC Motors in China has just launched an electric car. They're not talking about launching it, they've made it, it's on the road. And this electric car has a battery, and this battery contains, wait for it, no lithium. No lithium, none. The car, a small and relatively lightweight vehicle, is powered by sodium ion batteries, which, yes, have a lower energy density than lithium ion. But they are much, much cheaper, and they use very abundant materials, and they work much better in cold climates, interestingly. Car News China describes the car as having a 252 kilometer or 157 mile range from a 25 kilowatt hour battery. But that does seem a little bit generous from 25 kilowatts. Anyway, it's not a long haul vehicle, but it, it's going to be perfect for driving around cities. And this car is going to be cheap. No news yet just how cheap, but hopefully Elliot Richards, who's a wonderful correspondent in Shanghai, will be able to tell us later this year. And while we're on the topic of materials needed for batteries, this story about a dried up lake in California called the Salton Sea is quite interesting. According to new research carried out by the US Department of Energy, there is enough lithium in the area to build the batteries for 375 million electric cars. This lake has been destroyed over the last 100 years by extracting water for local agriculture. So it's human intervention that has caused this utter disaster in this lake. But now that damage might have positive side effects. Companies are working towards a direct lithium extraction technology that can extract the brine and separate the lithium from the other metals without having massive evaporation ponds. But people who love to jump up and down screaming about how terrible electric vehicles are have stopped, it seems, whining about lithium or even about children digging up cobalt in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, because as we know, a lot of that cobalt is used in refining fossil fuel. But now they've moved on from that. Now they love battery fires. Oh, that gives them so much reassurance and deep joy in their raggled, miserable souls. If a petrol or diesel car catches fire, no one gives a flying toss because it happens all the time and it's just normal. In fact, when I was driving up here from Sydney, we saw two, count them, vehicle fires. One was a petrol car, the other was a diesel truck, both on fire on the side of the highway. Yes, it happens all the time, you barely notice it. Here's a bit of data from you from London. Data obtained by Air Quality News through a Freedom of Information request revealed that in 2019, the London Fire Brigade, and that covers a big area, and about 20 million people live in that area, dealt with just 54 electric vehicle fires, compared to, wait for it, 1,898 petrol and diesel fires, none of which would have been reported in the newspapers. Now you can say there's more petrol and diesel cars than electric cars in cities. Yes, there generally is, but in London, my goodness, there's a lot of electric cars. There was a recent incident on board a car transporter ship called the Fremantle Highway. I'm just wondering whether you can hear that. There is a noise in the background that is a petrol powered leaf blower, which I think is the apex of insane technology that burns fossil fuel. Just saying that, just in case you can hear it. <laughs> a leaf blower, for pity's sake. Anyway, recent incident on board an electric car transporter called the Fremantle Highway. A big fire broke out when the ship was in the North Sea off the coast of the Netherlands. One poor fellow was actually killed and a few members of the crew were injured. Now the old school press never mentioned anything about the casualties. They were in ecstasy. They were 
I won't use anything ruder, but they were on the verge of a big thing that begins with an O, screaming about how it was an electric vehicle that caused the fire and they should be immediately banned. Oh, they absolutely love this fire. Well, now we know what actually happened. The ship was carrying 3,200 petrol and diesel cars and 500 electric models. Now, most of the petrol and diesel cars were burnt out, completely gone, burnt to a crisp, nothing left, just puddles of melted aluminium. But on the lower decks, where the electric cars had been stored, there was no damage at all, and all the vehicles were perfectly right, and they were literally driven off the ship. They were not damaged. Weirdly, this story got zero coverage in the UK press, I know for a sure. The fire started in a diesel car, just like the fire in the car park at Luton Airport, that the press also went into ecstasy about saying it was an electric car. There were no electric cars in that car park, literally none. It was a diesel car. I know I've mentioned this in previous episodes, but I don't care. I will continue to harp on about it. I will continue to attack and, um, and insult anyone who spreads this ludicrous lie about vehicles. I'm talking cars and trucks and buses and vans, not electric bikes, that's a whole other topic. But cars, yeah, it, makes, it doesn't make me angry at all. I'm really happy about it. All technology can fail, but petrol and diesel cars are statistically more dangerous. I've recently recorded a podcast with Emma Sutcliffe, who is an actual fire officer who has to deal with actual vehicle fires. She knows what actually happens, and it's really worth a listen. It's on the Fully Charged Show podcast. As with every other story in this episode, all the links are in the show notes, including the link to the podcast. And now, this is like a proper news show where there's a lighter story at the end. It's about a farmer in Western Australia who lives on a 1,750-acre property. Quite big, not like super big in Australia, but a big property in Malewa, uh, which is about 280 kilometres north of Perth in Western Australia. And this is for the poor old souls who are still saying in Australia, your EV may be OK for silly use, but it's hopeless in the outback. Well, this farmer, Geoffrey Johnson, invested in an electric car that he powers with solar energy that he produces on his farm. He said many drivers in regional Australia are dismissing the technology unfairly when it could deliver them significant fuel savings. He's driven more than 12,500 kilometres in his electric MG and his annual fuel costs are basically zero. Now that is different to buying a liquid fuel, putting it in a tank and burning it. I don't know if anyone's worked that out because you have to pay for that liquid fuel. So if you were to reduce that cost by, let's say, 99.9%, .9%, I think you'd notice. And the car is adequate for what he needs. He can drive around, goes to the shops. And I know what this Outback Australia is like. There's never a shop just around the corner. It's usually about a 100 kilometres drive. Farmer Johnson said Australians in regional areas should take time to educate themselves. This is an Australian farmer talking. About, they should educate themselves about the technology and do the sums on how much they could save by using solar rather than liquid imported toxic filthy fuel. There we go. That story really cheered me up. That's it. Hopefully I'll see some of you at the show in Sydney. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing. You can't miss it if you're in the area. But in the meantime, if you have been, thank you for watching.